speak tonight. It's a great pleasure to, to be with you. Uh, interestingly, this is the second Cafe Scientific that I've been able to take part in, the first being in uh, Bournemouth around five years ago at the time of the uh, 2016 Olympics. Um, the use of hormones in sport, as you've mentioned, has been an interest of mine for around uh, 20 years now. And that really was the length of time almost that it took us to develop a test for growth hormone misuse uh, in sport. Uh, that particular work was actually pioneered by Professor Peter Songson, who it was the Professor of Diabetes and Endocrinology up at St. Thomas's. Uh, hospital in London, where I uh, did a lot of my training, and I did some of my research with him. Um, when Peter retired, he actually retired to just outside Winchester, knew that I'd moved down to uh, Southampton, and suggested that he and I actually um, started to work together to take the work forward that he'd already started in terms of developing uh, a test for growth hormone misuse. Uh, and since then, we've both become Romseyites. So uh, I'm now living in the centre of Romsey, and Peter actually lives just outside in uh, Stanbridge Earls. So as I say, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, with you tonight. Um, it's, it's going to be an interesting experience trying to do this uh, as a Zoom lecture, because as John uh, mentioned, I would like a, a number of points during the, uh, during the uh, talk to just ask you a few of your opinions and your thoughts, um, please enter those through the chat function and one of our other panelists will then relay them to me and we'll try and get a bit of a discussion uh, going. So the plan is to talk for probably about 45 minutes or so and then give you the opportunity to uh, raise any questions or thoughts that you have around this particular uh, topic. So this is Ben Johnson, and of course Ben Johnson came to fame at the Seoul Olympic Games back in 1988. And he really came from um, a level of obscurity, and despite that, as you can see, really wiped the floor with the rest of the field at the uh, Olympic 100 meter final. Sadly, his fame, well actually, or at least his triumph, only lasted for about uh, 24 hours because he was subsequently uh, disqualified for having taken an anabolic steroid. And we'll talk a bit about anabolic steroids throughout the lecture. He was also actually subsequently interviewed and admitted not only to taking anabolic steroids, one hormone, but also to taking growth hormone as well. So I mentioned that we're going to do a bit of um, a bit of uh, uh, audience participation. So the first question that I would like to ask you, the audience, is when did doping actually first start? What are the very earliest records of doping? So perhaps I can just, while you're thinking and adding your thoughts to the chat, perhaps I could just ask our panelists when they think uh, doping was first recorded. Oh, I, I should think, I should prob probably think the, the ancient Greeks <laughs> so the ancient Greeks. Any other thoughts? Any advance on the ancient Greeks? I was, was going to guess after the Second World War, probably 1950s. But ah, uh, the 1950s. Okay, well, yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts from from anybody else? Well, I would have thought it's been there forever. I mean, if people can do something to enhance their performance, they're going to do it. So I'd say Egypt that we know of, ancient <laughs> Egypt. So we've actually got a bit of a spectrum. I don't know if there are any answers in the in the chat box that uh, that that one of the panelists might be able to pass through. David Graham Dawkins Kerwin says nineteenth century. Nineteenth century. So actually, we've got quite a span all the way back from the ancient Greeks all the way up to modern history. Well, John, you were right actually. So, <laughs> So the very earliest um, reports of doping in sport would actually come from the ancient Olympic Games and, um, back, back in the times of ancient Greece. And uh, probably one of the first, uh, uh, the first descriptions of taking performance enhancing drugs was of a sprinter called Charmis, who was reported to uh, take figs regularly as a mechanism of trying to improve his performance. Exactly how that actually did work or not, uh, we're not quite sure, 
um, from the records, but at least those are some of the earliest thoughts. It's also interesting to think about the term doping, where, where the, does that actually come from? So one school of thought thinks it comes from uh, the South African language uh, um, the, uh, uh, of the of the Kaffir nation, uh, uh, where they where they actually take a, uh, a, um, a a substance to improve their performance, and they, that was known as DOP. But the other other people actually think that this comes from the time of prohibition when alcohol was known as uh, as doping at that time. But uh, again, as with a lot of the things in this particular area, it's uh, 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 hidden in in obscurity. So although, although there is a long standing history of people trying to take substances to improve their performance, probably the modern history of doping really begins in the 19th century. And at the time, there were really good records of what people actually took in order to improve their performance. And part of the reasons why we have such good records at the time from that time is that at the time it was considered to be completely normal, completely legitimate, and indeed encouraged that athletes, once they had gone through the physiology of training and the nutrition, that they might turn to other pharmacological agents in order to improve their performance. And it's interesting to think about some of the agents that they used. So one of them, caffeine, is one of the few legalized performance enhancing drugs. So for those of you that are taking your caffeine, your coffee first thing in the morning, you might actually be able to improve your athletic performance too. I think maybe some of the other agents you'd be less keen to take, things like strychnine, belladonna and morphine. And at the time, often cycle races involved people cycling for as far as they could over a period of about 24 to 48 hours. And that involved the cyclists staying up and cycling overnight and often needed things to not only improve their, their uh, performance of their muscles, but also things to keep them awake. Now, of course, one of the issues around uh, doping is that it comes with a risk of harm. And one of the first people who was alleged to have died as a result of doping was Arthur Linton, who was indeed a cyclist, who was alleged to have died in 1886, having taken an overdose of a drug known as trimethyl. So I guess the question that we might actually ask ourselves is why did athletes dope? And I guess in a sense, it's a slightly it's a um, self-fulfilling question, really, because the reason why athletes dope is because they want to win. They want to be the person that goes over the, uh, the finish line first. They want to be the people who dump the highest, dump the furthest, run the quickest. And part of the reasons why athletes are prepared to dope in order to improve their performance is that they can get away with it because of ineffectual anti-doping control. And despite all of the efforts of the World Anti-Doping Agency, the anti-doping agencies will always be a step or two behind the athletes and their pharmacologists. And also there are very careful um, um, measures that are put in place by the anti-doping agencies to try to ensure that innocent athletes are not, uh, are not um, are not prejudiced by a false test. So I'm going to ask you another question now in the audience, and I'd really like, re please do put your thoughts into the, into the chat box. And just think about why athletes dope and how likely they are to be prepared to do so. So this is not a survey of the Russian athletes, and we've heard a lot about doping in from Russia recently. This is not a survey from people from the old East, East Germany. This was a poll that was undertaken some uh, 25 years ago in 198 elite US athletes, and it was published in, uh, in Sports Illustrated. 
and they posed a question to these 198 athletes. They said, you are offered a banned performance enhancing substance with two guarantees. The first is you will not be caught. And the second thing is you'll win. So they were then asked that, uh, given that scenario and said, under those circumstances, would you take that substance? So I'd like you just to put into the chat box and I'll ask our panelists as well, what proportion of that 198 were prepared to take that performance enhancing drug with those two caveats? So John, do you want to, do you want to be- I the, would, I would guess probably about 80% said they would. So about 80%, okay. So what's that, it's about 160 or so. So do I have any other bids beyond yeah, that? We have, we have some results here. So most of the most of the participants are saying 98, 99, 100%. One of them says 50%. One strangely says, oh, 160 out of 198. Yeah. Um, so we can, we can see, high numbers. So we can see that people are very cynical about, about athletes, aren't they? And of course, they're absolutely right to be because in fact, what they found was that 195 out of those 198 athletes said that they were prepared to take that performance enhancing drug. But I think that the supplementary question that was asked of the athletes is also even more interesting. So this was the second question that these 198 athletes were posed with. So you're offered a performance enhancing drug that comes with two guarantees. <laughs> Firstly, you're not gonna get caught again. So there's no question of recrimination you will win every competition you enter for the next five years, but then you will die as a result of side effects from that particular performance enhancing substance. Would you take it? So how many do you think would actually take it under this particular scenario? 5%. 5% was that, John? Five, yeah. Yeah, one in, one in 20? I'd say 40. So 40%, was, was that Mike that said that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say higher, that. Much higher, 80%. Panelists oh. saying 90, 70, 50, and 25, <laughs> and 33. So, so I guess there's a, there's a much bigger spectrum here, and you, you can perhaps understand why, but in fact, what they responded was that still just over half would be prepared to take that performance-enhancing drug, despite the fact that they would actually die as a result of that. And I think what that really tells us is what is actually driving these athletes, that they are so focused on the short-term goals of winning their competitions that they don't always think about the long-term harm that can come from taking performance-enhancing drugs. And of course, that's one of the rationales for actually having good anti-doping regulation is to actually protect athletes from, from them from themselves and from their unscrupulous uh, team doctors and uh, managers that might be encouraging them to take a performance enhancing drug. And so the anti-doping uh, movement actually really began in the 1960s. And what really started to happen was that people started to recognize the harm that the athletes were putting themselves under and felt that this was not really what we needed to be, needed to be part of the ethos of sport. So the first Olympic fatality was back in uh, 1960, Knut Jensen, who was taking part in a team cycling event, and it's thought he probably died as a result of having taken amphet amphetamines. So really the rationale for the anti-doping movement is that we want to avoid the drug cause, the performance enhancing drug causing either physical or psychological harm to that individual. It was also recognized that actually, if one athlete thought that another athlete was taking a drug, that they would themselves be much more likely to take a performance enhancing drug that themselves. And do you remember I showed you Ben Johnson right at the very beginning of the talk, well, on the start line, there were seven other sprinters, and of those seven other sprinters, six of them were found guilty of a doping offence at some point during their careers after that particular, that particular race. 
There is also actually a thought about the ethos of taking a drug in sport. The drug certainly gives an advantage, but there's also a thought that it gives an unfair advantage, that it's against the ethos of the sport. Now, of course, we can argue about these rationales because, for example, I could say to you that more people worldwide have died as a result of injuries within a rugby scrum or hurtling down a mountain with downhill skiing than have ever died as a result of having taken a performance enhancing drug. But we allow people to do that. And that's seen to be within the ethos and the rules of the sport, whereas taking a drug isn't. And also, we have to also, we also have to acknowledge that sport is not fair. You know, much though I would love Southampton to win the Premiership, they don't have the same budget that Manchester United, Liverpool, Arsenal, Manchester City have. And similarly, one might think about the Olympics, that the training that's available for individual countries' athletes may differ hugely. And one might argue, you know, is it, is it fair? And we have just seen as a result of the uh, lottery funding that's happened in the, uh, uh, in the UK, that this has then translated into very large success within, uh, within the Olympics. And arguably, that's also not fair. So, but in the end, we have to make a decision about whether we feel that actually allowing athletes to take a performance enhancing drug is within that spirit of fairness within, within a sport. And I certainly want to see an athlete who's got the best physiology, the person that's trained the most winning a game, rather than somebody who's got the best pharmacologist who's able to give them a drug to allow them to do that. But one might actually discuss that ethics at the end of the talk if we would like to do so. So let's now move on and think a little bit more about the science and think about the doping with hormones. And I think it's probably important to, again, give a little bit of background and a little bit of a, a little bit of history before talking about individual hormones that athletes might have uh, might have uh, taken. Again, an understanding of the effects of hormones goes all the way back to big biblical times. It's been known for as long as there is history that castrating male cow, uh, ma male um, cattle leads to change in the way that they grow and the way that they behave. The ancients might not have known that that was caused by testosterone and removing that testosterone, but nevertheless, they were certainly aware of the effects. But the more modern history of endocrinology and the effects of hormones really begins again in the 19th century. And probably one of the earliest records comes from Charles Brown Saccard, who lived in the 19th century and presented at the French Royal Society a, uh, the, French, the, French, the French Scientific Society, the results of some of the experiments that he had done on himself. And he described how he had taken first the blood of testicular veins, then semen, and then thirdly, juice that he had extracted from the testicle of either a dog or a guinea pig and injected himself with those particular substances. And he then reported at this, at this meeting, that he had had a radical change in his health with significant improvements in his physical and mental well-being. And after he stopped taking these, these substances, that he went back to his almost state, his previous state of uh, weakness. Now, I think these experiments tell us a couple of things. The first thing I think it tells us is that the medical ethics around doing research is actually very different today than it was uh, back in the 19th century. And I can tell you that there'd be no way that we would be allowed to do this sort of experiment, uh, uh, this experiment today. I think the second thing that we can probably say from these experiments is that it demonstrates the value of the placebo effect, because I'm absolutely certain that none of the benefits that uh, Charles Brown Sicard 
um, obtained by doing these injections were actually from the endocrinology uh, and the testosterone that came from the drugs. But nevertheless, the genie was out of the, uh, out of the bottle and the thought about using hormones to improve performance was really born. So I, I appreciate that we've got a wide uh, ranging audience uh, listening today. And I think that it's important for me just to let you know a little bit about what a hormone is, where it comes from, and some of the things that hormones can do. So what hormones are, are effectively messengers that are released from a number of different glands into the blood, and then they, are, they circulate in the blood and then affect the way that cells behave in other parts of the body. Sometimes it might be just one other part of the body, and for some hormones, this might be many parts of the body. And hormones are amazingly important in terms of the way that we grow and we develop, and it has a huge effect, not just during childhood, but also throughout our whole lives. So it affects childhood growth and development, Hormones are responsible for what makes us go through puberty. They affect how our body uses energy. It affects and regulates the amount of salts and sugars in our blood. It affects our blood pressure and our states of hydration. Hormones are also important in telling us that it's time to eat and many, many, many other actions that they have. So they are hugely important messengers and one of the main ways in which the body communicates with itself. When we think about the endocrine system, although hormones can be made in a lot of different tissues, the, the tissues that, or the glands that are listed on the left of this slide are the main topics of, of endocrinology from a clinical perspective. So for example, I'm going to be talking tonight specifically about growth hormone, which is uh, produced by the uh, pituitary gland, which is a pea-sized gland which sits at the base of the brain but produces a, a number of hormones that are in, important but growth hormones the one that I'm going to focus on today. I'm also going to talk about erythropoietin which is a hormone that's made from the, uh, from the kidneys and erythropoietin is a hormone that's important in regulating the number of red blood cells that are produced in the body. And I'll also be spending quite a lot of time talking about the sex steroids, the so-called anabolic androgenic steroids, things like estrogen, things like testosterone, because these are also key hormones that are taken by, uh, by athletes. So let's now start off by thinking about an anabolic androgenic steroids and particularly thinking about testosterone and its derivatives. Because I think if you ask most people, what hormone do you think is going to be the one that's most commonly used? They would probably would say uh, testosterone and indeed they'd be absolutely right about that. So testosterone was first isolated and then, um, then manufactured synthetically back in the early uh, 1930s by a German Adolf Butentant and also a creation Leopold Ruzeka. And the history of testosterone misused by athletes actually goes back almost back to that time when it was first isolated. And it's actually rumoured that in the Berlin Olympic Games back in 1936, that it was rumored that the German team actually took testosterone and that was part of the reasons for their success at the time. This has never been proven, and of course this might just be hearsay, but it's interesting to think that the athletes were often there, and we'll see this for growth hormone as well, that the athletes were often there before the endocrinologists and clinicians thought to use these substances to treat medical conditions. One of the first actually documented case of testosterone doping was not actually in humans, it was in horse racing, and it was given to an 18 year old horse named Holloway. And poor old Holloway, in uh, the winter of 1941 was actually finding that he was getting to the end of his racing career and he was not actually up to the same speed. He wasn't really that keen to go out racing as he had previously. And he was given testosterone. And as a result of that, actually won a number of further races or was placed and established a trotting record at the grand old age of uh, 19. 
Now, John very kindly mentioned that I've been involved in the uh, World Anti-Doping Agency looking at doping in humans, but I should also say that actually doping within um, horse racing and other animal racing is also rife as well, and there are anti-doping agencies that work with animals as well as working with humans. So let's just give you a few facts about uh, anabolic, steroid, um, anabolic steroid use. So um, the World Anti-Doping Agency analyzes something close to around 300,000 athlete samples every year. And they make a report that comes out and is published on their, on their website. And it's fairly consistent in terms of the, in terms of the reporting that around one to one and a half percent of those tests are found to have an adverse analytical finding. In other words, the lab has found something within that substance that uh, sh either shouldn't be there or there is a marker of something that shouldn't be there. And as you can see from the slide, about a half of those adverse tests, those positive tests, are from anabolic steroids, about 15% from stimulants. Athletes are also quite canny in that they will often take other drugs to hide the fact that they've been taking a performance enhancing drug. But for them, that those, uh, those drugs that can lead to hiding of them are also uh, prohibited. And about 5% of those, or 5 to 10%, are other hormones. And as I say, we'll talk about those in due course. The title, is in, uh, the title of my talk was The Use and uh, the Misuse of Hormones in Sports and in Leisure. And it's also true to say that anabolic steroids are not just used among elite professional support uh, sports, they're also used within the general population. And interestingly, the most common group of individuals taking anabolic steroids are heterosexual young men who are not taking it for performance benefits, they're taking it for cosmetic benefits because they want to look better when they're trying to attract a girlfriend. And when there's been surveys done of young adults, and indeed older adults, it's about one in 200 people that have admitted to having taken an anabolic steroid uh, regularly, and that uh, around two, two and a half percent of younger adults at uh, US high stock schools have taken an anabolic steroid at some, at some point. Now, if you think that one in 200, that's actually very, uh, that's a high number of people who've taken anabolic steroids. I suspect that some of this may be over-reporting, I'm not sure it's quite as high as that, but even if the numbers were out by tenfold, it would still be a lot of people taking these anabolic steroids. So the question is, why do they take them? And I suppose you can see the effects of this particular chap having taken an anabolic steroid. The reason why people take anabolic steroids is because of their effect, particularly on muscle bulk and muscle strength. And if you're working to try to improve uh, uh, function within a sport where uh, strength is of particular benefit, then taking an anabolic steroid is likely to, uh, to have benefit. Now, interestingly, actually, if we start to think about bodybuilders, of whom this uh, gentleman certainly is one example, um, at one point, there was a, a big discussion about whether they ought to allow bodybuilding competitions with anabolic steroids or with performance enhancing drugs. And it led to the situation where they had some competitions where people were clean, i.e. hadn't taken anabolic steroids, and others that had been taking anabolic steroids. What they found is that people in the clean competitions were still taking anabolic steroids because they thought well, they were more likely to win if they, if, they, if they were competing against other people who hadn't. So in the end, that was then, uh, then um, uh, stopped. Now, interestingly, there has been a huge debate over the last 50 years about whether anabolic steroids actually work in real practice. I think that the debate has now been fully resolved that these drugs certainly do improve strength and performance. But it's interesting to think that some back in 1977, there were articles written like this one, suggesting that there was no, there was no evidence that these anabolic steroids would improve an athlete's performance. Now, just remember the date of this. It's 1977. The next slide actually comes from a PhD which was written in East Germany 
in the late 70s and early 80s. East Germans certainly knew at the time that anabolic steroids certainly improved performance. And here you can see the distance that a female East German athlete threw her shot put over a period of two and a half months when she was being systematically doped by the Stasi and the East German government with an anabolic steroid. And you can see there's no doubt that this woman was able to take, was able to throw her shot put further than, other, than, than she was before. And in fact, when we start to think about the effects of anabolic steroids, generally we see the effect being much larger in women than in men. And so one of the things that the anti-doping agencies do when they start to think whether there is state-sponsored doping is when they start to observe that a country's female athletes significantly outperform their, their male counterparts. Now, sadly, the effect of the, um, the, effect of the uh, doping at uh, it, it, by these Germans really had a long-term effect on what we see today. So here we have a graph that shows the winning distance of the shot put going back all the way to 1948, as far as the, um, the Rio games in 2016. So what we can see is that from about the early 50s, there is then a gradual rise in the distance that a, the winning, the winning woman threw. We also know in the 19, 60s and 70s was a time when these Germans were being systematically doped. You can see the effect that actually the IOC banning anabolic steroids had, absolutely nothing. And it's only really when the athletes had to undergo testing for the performance enhancing drugs, that it started to limit the amount of anabolic steroid that was being used. But just look what's happened to the winning distance of that Olympic women's shot put. If we look at the winning distance in 2016, it was still lower than it was in 1980. And I can tell you that none of the athletes None of those female athletes who were in the final at Rio, including the gold medalist, would have reached the final in 1980. And that's the effect, the legacy effect that we have of the systematic doping of these female East German athletes. So why is taking an anabolic steroid a problem or indeed any other hormones? Because if you remember, part of the rationale for the anti-doping is to prevent harm, either physical or psychological, to the athletes. And one of the effects that we see by giving anabolic steroids to women is that they become virilized. In other words, they become more and more like men. And I think one of the most striking stories that actually comes from that era of East German doping comes from Heidi Krieger, who was the 1986 European shot put champion. And there is a book that describes what happened to her. And the book is called, They Killed Heidi. And that book was actually written by Andreas Krieger, who is the same person as Heidi, but underwent a sex change operation. And he said that the only reason that he believes that he was in that position, needing to have that sex change operation, was because of the systematic doping that he'd had from the, from the testosterone. So here's another example of a woman who has been doping with anabolic steroids. And I think if you just glance at that photograph and I hadn't given you that background, you might have thought that this was in fact a male athlete. And in fact, this particular cyclist, Tammy, Tammy Thomas, appeared to be shaving. And indeed, when she was seen by an endocrinologist in Colorado, 
was found to have very masculinized features, had a deep voice, had a full beard, had chest hair, and also had signs of male pattern baldness. Although um, I'm not quite sure what the problem with baldness is, um, uh, being somebody who's somewhat follically challenged myself. So is there something that we can do to anabolic steroids in order to, or anab an anabolic uh, steroids in, a, in order to try to still get the muscle building effect, the so-called androgenic effect, without getting that male virilization effect, the, the, sorry, the androgenic effect, but still be able to get the muscle building anabolic effect. And this is the basic structure of testosterone. It comes from, uh, from cholesterol. And over the years, a huge number of different pharmacological and chemistry changes have been made to the testosterone molecule in order to try to make the substance less androgenic, so less likely to cause that virilization, but still have the anabolic effect. And this is also not only benefit from the lack of androgenic effects, but it also makes it much harder for the anti-doping scientists to actually, um, to actually uh, detect it. And I'll talk a little bit about the Balco scandal, which was a situation where a pharmaceutical importer in San Francisco was importing performance enhancing drugs, systematically supplying them to US and European athletes with very complex pharmacological regimens. And when this, when this actually happened, the, 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 they, were, they were discovered by two uh, news reporters who managed to get a small spent uh, syringe with a very small amount of liquid in it. And that was sent down to the anti-doping laboratory in Los Angeles. And with this very tiny amount of fluid, the anti-doping scientists down in LA were able to identify a new anabolic steroid that had been developed that was at least two or three stages away from what had previously been known and detectable. So there's no doubt that the athletes who are abusing steroids have very powerful pharmacologists and backers behind them. So we don't want to be giving anabolic steroids to, to women because, it's, because of the virilization effects. What about men? Well, there are also a number of other effects of anabolic steroids that are not just not just affect women, they affect men as well. Taking anabolic steroids is very bad for your liver. It can cause jaundice, as you can see at the top right. It can kill the cells of the liver. It can cause something called pelio peliosis hepatis, which is shown in the right at the bottom. That's where you get these blood-filled cysts within the, uh, within the liver that can bleed, and it can also lead to, uh, to liver cancer. So really not, not great things to have. It's not great for your heart as well, so it can often precipitate heart attack. And indeed, when you start to see young men coming into hospital with heart attack in their 20s and early 30s, one of the things that I have to think about, or at least my colleagues now have to think about in the casualty, is, is this somebody who's been taking an anabolic steroid? And anybody who has had a son who's gone through puberty will know absolutely that testosterone can have effects on mood and irritability and, and, uh, and aggression. And of course, that also happens in athletes who take anabolic steroids. And they often find that, what they, that they go through periods of high mood and irritability and aggression when they're taking it. And when they have an off phase, when they're not taking it, that they then slump in, into depression. And that can also lead to quite serious psychiatric illnesses as well. So yes, anabolic steroids are very powerful, but they also cause a lot of harm. So let's now move on to growth hormone, uh, my particular area of interest. And growth hormone is actually a bit of a younger hormone than, uh, than um, the uh, testosterone. It was only first like, extracted from the human pituitary back in uh, 1956. It was used clinically for the first time in around 1959 to treat children who had growth deficiency. Sadly, a lot of those early preparations were contaminated with Jakob Creutzfeldt disease, the, the 
um, the substance, the prion, that actually causes mad cow disease. And so that was then stopped for uh, growth hormone use was stopped for many years until it was possible to create it in a laboratory. In the 1990s, there were studies performed, including studies by Peter Sonson, actually showing that this hormone, although was absolutely vital for children, was also important in adults and led to its licensing for use in 1996. So that was the first time that adults used it, or adult endocrinologists use it. What, what, about, what, about, um, uh, what, what about athletes? When were they there? So again, time for a quick audience participation. When do you think athletes first started using uh, growth hormone? Nineteen eighty. Nineteen eighty. That's that's a pretty good that's a pretty good shout. It was in fact probably one of the or at least one of the first records of athletes using it was actually in Dan Duchesne's under, Underground Steroid Handbook which was written in 1982, in which he describes uh, growth hormones being an amazing stuff, already well-established in uh, strength events, but also likely to be important in terms of uh, uh, endurance events. And the fact that he had very good descriptions of, of uh, growth hormone use in 1982 uh, suggests that it was, had probably been used before. I've already mentioned Ben Johnson, we also have records of it being widely used at the Atlanta Games, so much so that they were nicknamed the Growth Hormone Games. We have records of, from, 19, uh, from 1998 of growth hormone being found in the Dutch, uh, a Dutch team car at the Tour, de France, sorry, the Tour de France. But also in the same year, growth hormone was found to be smuggled in by a Chinese swimmer to the uh, World Swimming Championships in, in Perth. And in fact, this was the subject of an exhibition at the Science Museum up, up in, uh, up in um, London. Now, interestingly, the growth hormone that was found in this Chinese swimmer's uh, um, luggage had actually been exported to China to treat children with growth hormone deficiency. And of course, what that meant is that those children who needed that growth hormone couldn't have it. And we also have reports in the UK of children Oh, sorry, the parents of children with growth hormone deficiency selling their children's growth hormone on the black market because it's so valuable. And in fact, the clever ones sell half of the growth hormone. So the child then goes back to their next endocrinology clinic, not growing as much as they should. And so the dose is then doubled or increased, giving that person yet more growth hormone to sell. So it's not just the athletes that are harmed. There's a wider societal effect of, of substance misuse. Werner Reiterer in uh, the Sydney Olympic Games in 2000 alleged that the Australian team had been doped with growth hormone. Now, interestingly, about nine months before the Olympic Games, there was a targeted robbery of a pharmaceutical importer in Sydney. And the only thing that was taken was about 1,500 vials of growth hormone. And uh, coincidentally, I really do mean coincidentally, the amount of growth hormone that would be required to treat the Australian Olympic Games for nine months is about 1,500 vials. So no comments on that. I mentioned about the Balco scandal. So there was then uh, Tim Montgomery, Marion Jones uh, were found to having had taken growth hormone. Uh, Sylvester Sloan, obviously not a, an athlete, but described how he... Had to, was actually found uh, um, smuggling growth hormone into Australia for his own use. And he described how part of his physique was maintained by taking growth hormone alongside, uh, alongside testosterone. Senator Mitchell launched a report about uh, growth hormone use in Major League Baseball and suggested it was very widespread, largely because of the lack of a test. Dwayne Chambers, English uh, sprinter, also disqualified for taking growth hormone. And this is Terry Newton. And Terry Newton's story is particularly sad. Terry Newton used to play rugby league for Wakefield, and he was the first person ever to be detected taking growth hormone through a laboratory finding. He'd been taking, he was coming to the end of his rugby career, and he'd been taking it in order to try to improve 
his ability to recover after injury. And that's one of the reasons why growth hormone is taken. As a result, he lost his contract. Effectively, his career was ended because of his age. His marriage broke down as a result of the stress. And sadly, he then took, he committed suicide nine months later. And then finally on this chart, we have two Russian powerlifters. And these are two powerlifters that were disqualified from the Paralympics in London 2012. So it's not just the Olympics that are affected, Paralympics as well. And they were actually caught with the test that we developed here in Southampton. So why do, growth, why do athletes take growth hormone? Well, like testosterone, it also increases lean mass, but unlike testosterone, it reduces the amount of fat tissue there is. So if you think that if you're trying to run fast, you want more effective muscle and less and less fat. But it's also good at actually making sure you get the fats and the glucose and the sugars to the muscle to actually provide them with the energy for, for exercise. It's good for your heart. As I mentioned in the situation of Terry Newton, it improves recovery. And on the right, I've got a CT scan of a thigh of an individual who had growth hormone deficiency. And these are taken at the same scale. And you can see that over six months of taking growth hormone, the amount of muscle mass increases significantly. And the reason why it's not quite as bright is because there's less fat there. But here we have, again, the same sort of story as we had for the anabolic steroids. The athletes are clearly taking it because they're believing that they're getting a benefit, but the scientists don't believe it. And in fact, the scientists go one step further and say, look, we've got nature's experiment of what happens when somebody produces too much growth hormone. And that is a condition called acromegaly. And the man in the middle is somebody who's got acromegaly. And this is caused by a small tumor in the pituitary gland at the base of the brain that just produces too much growth hormone. It leads to changes in facial appearance. It gives high blood pressure. It changes the way the heart works. It gives you diabetes. It affects the uh, nerves. It gives you joint disease. And you might say, well, this is hardly an athletic individual. Why are we suggesting that too much growth hormone makes a difference? And furthermore, if we actually look at the studies, that although it might actually give the individual more muscle mass and less fat mass, it doesn't actually change the things that matters for, uh, for sport. But I think the athletes have got it right. They've got it right for the anabolic steroids. They've got it right for, the, for, for growth hormone as well. And the reason why I think this is that acromegaly doesn't provide us with a good model for the effects of growth hormone. By the time somebody's had acromegaly uh, diagnosed, they've often had it for many, many years. It often affects other pituitary hormones. And by that time, any athletic ability might have already passed. But interestingly, often if you see somebody with acromegaly in your clinic and ask them if there was a period when their sporting, when they were doing sport actually was better, well, actually, they often said that. And this is a very interesting case. This is written by a, an orthopedic surgeon working up in, uh, up in Oxford called Bob Sharp. And he was a medical student in the Oxford rowing team. He grew five centimeters while he was at Oxford. He was able to um, consume high calorie, high protein diet. His training was brilliant. He got the, the biggest improvements in his ergo times when he was doing the uh, onshore rowing exercises. And at his pinnacle, he won the Thames head of the river race with Matthew Penchant, only to be diagnosed with acromegaly six months later. I think one of the other things that's also important when we start to think about whether these hormones have an effect for an athlete is that we can't detect them in our clinical trials because our clinical trials are designed to look at large, large effects, 10% differences, 20% differences. And yet here we look at the results of the Coxless Four in the Athens Olympics when Matthew Pinson won his four fourth Olympic gold medal. And you can see that the winning time was only eight hundredths of a second or 0.2% of, of the race time. And in order to detect this across, to, to look for a size of effect of growth hormone of this sort of magnitude, you'd need to do a clinical trial that in 
involved the entire population of the planet. So I think athletes really can tell us something about these drugs. They know their performance, they're trained to look at small changes, and they're used to making small adjustments to their, 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 their um, training regime in order to make those small, small differences that make the difference between making the final and winning. And indeed, more recently, we have seen studies where growth hormone does have a positive benefit. This was undertaken in Australia by my friend, uh, Ken Ho. And again, what it illustrates is the point of taking multiple agents because the, the, the uh, volunteers who took part in the study had the greatest benefit, or at least amended, when they combined growth hormone with testosterone. So growth hormone sounds like a good thing, but it uh, also uh, has harmful effects. As I mentioned, we've got all of those effects that we've seen for, um, for in acromegaly, and they may be consequences of taking uh, growth hormone. Now, interestingly, at the time when uh, Ben Johnson was winning, uh, so was Floris Griffiths Joyner, shown on the right, and it's uh, reported that she died from a heart condition that looked very similar to the heart of somebody with acromegaly. Again, we don't know because, of course, this is all very hidden. So my final hormone is going to be erythropoietin and blood doping. And I appreciate that I'm slightly uh, behind time, but I'll, 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 I'll try and speed up to get through. So why do, we, why do people want to take um, erythropoietin? Well, the reason why they want to do that is that it increases the amount of red cells that are in their blood. The more red cells they've got in the blood, the more oxygen they can carry to their exercising mu muscle, which is particularly good for long distance runners and, and cyclists. Another way of doing that is to actually have a blood transfusion. And indeed there've been a number of different high profile cases. But the one that I'd just like to share with you is not actually a doping with erythropoietin. This was actually doping with, uh, doping with, um, with uh, a blood transfusion. And that was uh, Tyler Hamilton, who was a cyclist who used to cycle alongside Lance Armstrong. And the reason why I've called it the million dollar case is that this is how much it costs the US anti-doping agency to prosecute him. So what happens in blood doping, the way that we look for it, is it, in the, I'm sure you're all aware of things like the, your A positive or B positive. So you know A, B, O and rhesus negative and rhesus negative, uh, rhesus positive. Well, the whole host of different proteins on the surfaces of red blood cells that can be detected. And when Tyler Hamilton's blood were uh, were uh, investigated, he was found to have two different sets of blood tests, uh, two set different set of red blood cells. So some of them, about 90% of them were of one type and a very small number were of a different type. And that's usually indicative of having somebody having had a blood transfusion. And so he was, uh, he was uh, called before the agency, uh, the authorities and said, well, what's happened? And he came out, he, came, he, saw, he thought about it and spoke with his lawyers and said, well, what happened was that I'm a chimera. That's why I've got two different sets of bloods. And that can happen. So if you are, if you are a twin, you can get a transfusion of the blood of one of your twins to you during, during the time that you're born um, uh, during the time that your mother's carrying you. And this is what he said. He said, I'm, I was clearly a twin. I had a twin twin transfusion. Ah, but Tyler, there's a bit of a problem here because your birth certificate says that you were a singleton. That's a bit of a, that's a, bit of a problem, isn't it? So he said, oh, no, 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 no. I was a twin, but my twin died after the transfusion, but before I was born. Well, how do you disprove that? Well, in fact, the way they did it was to take another blood sample six months later. And of course, if he was a true chimera, we'd see the same pattern of blood, but that wasn't there. So why do they do it? Well, as I say, it improves the amount of oxygen. And one of the ways that you can legitimately improve your red cell mass is to go and do high altitude training. But only 50% of athletes respond. Interestingly, you can also get the same effect by going into a hypobaric diving chamber as well. But interestingly, that's uh, prohibited. So what are the risks? Well, if you've got too much, too many red blood cells, you can increase your risk of stroke. And of course, if you have transfusion, you risk the infection that can come through that. 
So I'd just like to finish off my talk by thinking a little bit about the legal use of sport, of hormones in sports. And here are two um, sportsmen who have taken hormones legally. So on the left, we have Sir Steve Redgrave, who developed diabetes between his fourth and fifth Olympic Games and needed to have insulin to treat his, his uh, diabetes. And on the right, Lionel Messi, who's recently moved from Barcelona, who took growth hormone as a child because he had short stature. And in order to allow athletes to take um, uh, um, um, hormones legally, they need to obtain a certificate that actually exempts, that, that allows them to use it. Because clearly, if you've got diabetes, type 1 diabetes, you need to take insulin. And there are also a number of other hormonal conditions where you need to take hormone replacement. And in order to do this, there has to be very careful control, very careful medical assessments. And if there aren't any alternatives, so for example, in diabetes, there is no alternative to insulin, that, that then can then be uh, allowed. So ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate that I'm slightly run over time and I apologize for that. So I'm just gonna conclude by saying that mankind has been aware of the use of hormones to enhance performance since biblical times. We know that the methods and the lens that athletes are going for to dope with hormones is becoming increasingly sophisticated. But I believe that it's right that what the um, anti-doping agencies have been done in order to keep the cl sport clean, but more importantly, to keep the athletes and wider public healthy. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening and thank you once again for the invitation to join you tonight.